Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Oh my gosh, it, it felt like just moments ago we finished another episode. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike. Across from me is Matthew. And you're the creator and host. I, well, yes, and you are the co-host. <laughs> Hello. For some reason, people get hung up on that. Everybody who sits in that chair has been a co-host. I'm the co-hostess with the mostest. Exactly. You're the co-hostess. <laughs> yeah. You need better legs. <laughs> hey, have you seen my calves? I give good calf. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Mm, 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 mm. On September 5th, 2009, Hilary Bunnell, 16, disappeared from Esgenobotich, formerly known as Burnt Church, in the Miramichi region of New Brunswick. Over the next several months, her mother, stepfather, family, and friends pulled out all the stops searching for the teen. Despite their tireless efforts, during which they utilized the media in a widespread poster campaign, they could not find Hillary. On Sunday, November 8, 2009, Curtis Wayne Bunnell, Hillary's first cousin, was arrested by the RCMP on an unrelated sexual assault allegation. In custody, Curtis began talking. He admitted he had knowledge of what had happened to Hillary Bunnell. You are listening to Dark Poutine Episode 193, MMIWG, What Happened to Hillary Bunnell? Nancy Hillary Bunnell was born on April 28, 1993, and was a member of the Mi'kmaq First Nation called Eskenobotich, a word that means the lookout at the town formerly known as Burnt Church in the Atlantic province of New Brunswick. For as long as there have been people in the region, the Mi'kmaq people have had a settlement of some description there. It has a long history. According to the Eskenobotich Nation's Facebook page, quote, the village is located on the western shores of Miramichi Bay, 5 kilometers south of the present-day community of Lagasville, and 38 kilometers northeast of the town of Miramichi. Between 1504 and 1534, the Mi'kmaq of Eskenobotich were regularly in contact with Basque, Breton, British, Normans, French, and Portuguese fishermen and fur traders. However, after the French explorer Jacques Cartier dropped anchor near the shores in 1535 to trade for furs, a mysterious epidemic swept through the Mi'kmaq throughout the Miramichi Bay. Even after the epidemic, the Mi'kmaq still maintained a village at Eskenobotich. Oral tradition states that Eskenobotich was considered a main village site during pre-colonial times. In 1658, Nicholas Denny reported that the village of Eskenobotich had a population around 500 individuals and counted over 80 wigwam and lodges in the village. Later, his son Richard Denny would marry a Mi'kmaq woman from Eskenobotich. From the University of New Brunswick website, the town of Burnt Church was named as a result of an event in the Seven Years' War. 
Following the capture of Lewisburg by the British in July 1758, Colonel James Murray was sent to destroy Acadian settlements in the Miramichi region. On the 17th of September 1758, Murray reported spending two days in Miramichi Bay, looking unsuccessfully for Acadians, but destroying anything he found. This included burning the first stone church built in New Brunswick. Established on March 5, 1805, Burnt Church was one of the earliest reserves in New Brunswick, with 2,058 acres set aside for the Mi'kmaq peoples living there. A report of Burnt Church is given by M. H. Purley in the Journal of the House of Assembly for 1842. It read, It is still a favorite Mi'kmaq settlement and much the largest in all New Brunswick. It has a good church, a school, a vibrant fishery, local craftspeople, and other evidences of progress and prosperity. Mi'kmaq traditions, governance, and their way of life have been maintained as much as possible by the residents of Ezganobotich despite colonialization. Part of that tradition are regular powwows that include traditional spiritual celebrations involving music, dance, and plenty of food. It was at one of those powwows in late August 2009 that a friend of Hilary Bonnell captured a photo of the 16-year-old taking part in the festivities. Hilary's mom, Pamela Fillier, later testified before the National Inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. She said that Hilary was smart and that she started talking at a very young age. Hilary's aunt, Pamela's sister, shot a video of Hilary when she wasn't even walking, but was able to grab a nearby adult and stand up. Hillary's aunt didn't realize it had happened in the moment, but when she looked back on the video, the little girl, not yet a year old, had reached up to her and said, Auntie. Hillary and her mom did lots of mother-daughter things together, like cooking, floating around in inner tubes on the nearby waterways. Young Hillary was fearless, jumping from a low bridge with the other kids into the water, and then cheekily making fun of her mom when she was too chicken to follow. According to internet posts about Hillary, she was an energetic girl who loved music as well as singing and dancing. Pamela Fillier's MMIWG inquiry testimony confirmed this. Fillier said, quote, She was just so full of life, she just lit up my house. We'd sit in my bedroom and we'd play that game Karaoke Wars. We would have so much fun, like I'd pick songs and she would pick them and she just really loved life. She loved every bit of it, end quote. Over the Labor Day weekend of 2009, Hillary was expected to be attending several parties hosted by friends on the Eskinopetich First Nation. It was to be the last big blowout before school began that year. Pamela Fillier had spoken to her daughter Hillary by phone at 3 a.m. on Saturday morning. This conversation was overheard by one of Hillary's friends who was not intoxicated. Hillary and her mother made plans to go shopping that afternoon so Hillary could get new clothes and supplies for the beginning of the school year. Pamela later recalled the phone call that she'd had with Hillary in the wee hours of that morning. She said, I asked her if she was okay. She said she was. The last thing we said to each other was, I love you. Pamela later said that she awoke that morning with a strong feeling that she couldn't shake. She and her husband, Fred Fillier, went to see her ex-stepmother at her camp for a visit. But she had a feeling that something was wrong, and that feeling would not leave her alone. While they were there, the stepmother received a call that a male relative had died. Pamela thought for a moment that might have been what the bad feeling was about, but as Pamela and Fred were leaving, she realized the feeling was still there, haunting her. There was something else wrong. She knew it. Hillary was still not home, so maybe that was it. Pamela tried calling Hillary's cell, but there was no answer. When Hillary did not show up for the outing to go shopping, Pamela was concerned and she still could not get through to Hillary. Hillary did not come home that evening either. Pamela later said that she thought maybe Hillary was still having fun with her friends and decided to stay out one more night. She'd done that before according to court documents, but the fact that Hillary hadn't checked in was still a concern for Pamela. On Sunday morning, Hillary was still not home, and Pamela had still not heard from her at all. Now she was certain that something was wrong, very wrong. Pamela called her sister and had her go look for Hillary in the neighborhood while Pamela stayed at the house in case Hillary returned home. Hillary's aunt looked around for her, but there was no sign of the girl. Pamela decided that she'd go out and look around herself and went to every house that she presumed Hillary had been to over the weekend. 
Pamela later told the MMIWG inquiry. When I went looking for her, the last house I went to, I asked the girl, I said, did you see Hillary anywhere? She said, I didn't see Hillary in over a week, but her sister just told me that she was with Hillary all night that night. No one seemed to have seen Hillary after that. Pamela called the RCMP to report Hillary as a missing person. There is a lot of warranted mistrust between Indigenous people and the police, in particular the RCMP. Pamela felt that the cops were not looking for Hillary at all, so rather than wait for the RCMP to do anything, Pamela and her family and friends in the community began their own search for Hillary Bunnell. Pamela said, quote, Big groups of men went all over looking for her. I mean, they literally kicked people's doors in. I will always be grateful to my community for doing that. They searched for her and still the police weren't searching, end quote. As the days passed with no real progress in the search for Hillary, Pamela also got in touch with local media outlets to put pressure on the police to do more. Right there is Canada's shame, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. At least one of them, yeah. Yeah, if Hillary had been a blonde white girl, mm-hmm. if Hillary had been a blonde white girl, the police would have been all over it, right? Yes, they would As with the media, mm-hmm. and rightly so, because with any missing person, you have to act quickly before the trail goes cold, right? Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, I think there's been a long history of that not happening when it's somebody who's First Nations or from another minority group. And we've seen it again and again and again and again, right? And it's not, say, all police. It's saying there's something systemic that's been happening. There is an actual syndrome called missing white woman syndrome. Okay. And it is a term used by social scientists and media commentators to refer to the media coverage, especially in television, of missing person cases involving young, white, upper middle class women or girls. Yeah. And... To the exclusion of attention. Of anyone else. Of anyone else who is a person of color or I any... Mean, and even look at, what's the, what was that serial killer's name in the gay village in Toronto? Bruce MacArthur. The gay community was saying there is a serial killer. Yes. Right? And like a week before mm-hmm. they actually caught him. Yes. The chief of police is like, oh, there's no serial killer. The community was saying there was. Yeah. Well, there was also one in the 70s that was denied as yeah. well. And yeah. I and it's personally just, think that was just, MacArthur. And it, the First Nations people have borne the brunt of this in mm-hmm. Canada. Mm-hmm. And it, sorry, I'm getting my... No, nope, let's my, do it. Gets my ire up. Yeah. Right? And now <laughs> is the time for us to talk about that but kind of I thing. But I like to think that I think that society social consciousness that we've finally realized that this is happening and i think the vast majority of the population of this country is demanding change here's a statistic for you and this is from 2008 but i think it has value today according to a 2008 study published in the law and society association aboriginal women who go missing in canada receive 27 times less coverage than white women. They also receive dispassionate and less detailed headlines, articles, and images. They're not us, right? Yeah. That's, I think, the sort of thinking somewhere along the line. Like, how on earth do you change that? I know CBC is trying. A lot of CBC podcasts do have a focus on uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. They do have that focus. They have Indigenous people involved in the programming, which Mm. is excellent. With episodes like this particular one, I feel like we are trying to do the right thing, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And I would rather be a part of the solution rather than a part of the the problem. problem, so... Thanks chiefly to Pamela Fillier's efforts to find her daughter, Hillary's likeness and details were all over the news, all over the web, everywhere you looked, in the eastern provinces. The family also paid for and put up posters all over the place. A Facebook group was started to aid in the search. One of the missing posters put up on the site included five photos of the missing girl along with her details. It read, Alert! Missing Child! Hillary Bunnell, 16 years old, missing since September 5, 2009, Burnt Church, New Brunswick. Black hair, brown black eyes, 5 foot 5 inches tall and weighing 134 pounds. Last seen at approximately 7.30 a.m. walking down Highway 11 in the Burnt Church First Nation. If you have seen Hillary or have any information about her whereabouts, please call your local police department, Crime Stoppers, or 911. End quote. Pamela felt she was getting the runaround from police. 
She said that she was passed from person to person and that no one she talked to seemed to be responsible for the case. She was often told that another investigator was assigned to it and she'd have to talk to that person but would have to wait as they weren't there at the time. When she called back and talked to the officer who'd been identified, that person said that it was actually someone else who was responsible. And so it went. Pamela was frustrated and scared for Hillary. It appears that RCMP were doing some investigating at least. In the days after Hillary's disappearance, they found some video of her taken on the morning that she'd vanished. Police discovered that at around a quarter to eight in the morning, Hillary went to 4D's convenience store in Burnt Church. She was there for two minutes and then left and began walking, presumably headed home to get some rest before the afternoon shopping excursion that she'd planned with her mom. As Hillary walked toward the center of Burnt Church, she was seen walking by several people traveling in their vehicles. None of the people who had seen the 16-year-old noticed anything unusual in Hillary's ability to walk. Nothing indicated that she was drunk or otherwise intoxicated in any way. The people in those vehicles were the last ones admitting that they had seen Hillary alive that morning. The video from the convenience store had more to show, though. Hillary had been in the store from 7.43 until 7.45. Police looked to see if other people had been in and out of 4D's convenience store around the same time as Hillary. Sure enough, there had been someone. There, arriving in his vehicle at 7.49, was Hillary's first cousin, Curtis Bonnell. He was in the store for only a minute, then left the property driving onto Route 11 toward Miramichi at 7.50 a.m., heading in what appeared to be the opposite direction that Hillary was walking. Regardless of this route, RCMP thought Curtis might be able to shed some light on what had happened to Hillary or where she'd gone next. They were cousins, after all, and knew each other very well. On September 19, 2009, a full two weeks after Hillary had gone missing, Curtis Wayne Bunnell came into the RCMP detachment in Egwak, New Brunswick. Curtis had been invited there by investigators to talk about his movements on the morning of Hillary Bunnell's disappearance. Constable Serge Minville, a longtime member of the RCMP, was the officer present for the interview with Curtis Bunnell. At that point, Curtis was not a suspect, only a person of interest. According to court documents, Constable Minville felt that the interview was unremarkable. Quote, the interview was video and audio recorded. Curtis told the officer that he had been with Dean Bunnell all night drinking and did not take Dean Bunnell to his home until, until after the two went to his sister Diana Bunnell's residence at approximately 8 o'clock in the morning on September 5, 2009 to get some more liquor. He also said that he had not seen Hillary Bunnell either that evening or the next morning. As part of his statement, Curtis told Constable Minville that his father had been trying to reach him that morning. But Curtis didn't want to answer the calls. He promised his dad that he would help him in loading firewood that morning, but as he was still in a partying frame of mind, he let the calls go to voicemail instead of answering. From court documents, what was significant from this interview was the self-assured manner that Curtis Bonnell displayed throughout the hour-long interaction with Minville. An example of that occurred when the officer left the interview room for a few moments, leaving his investigation file of the case on the desk. Curtis Bunnell was alone in the room with it. Shortly after Constable Minville closed the door upon leaving, Curtis took the file and began to leaf through it. He hummed to himself and seemed completely at ease with what he was doing. On a second occasion, later in the interview, Minville left the room again, saying that he would return soon and only had a few more questions for him. This time, Curtis began to sing quietly to himself while alone in the room. Shortly thereafter, he began to sing out loud and then called his father on his cellular telephone to come pick him up at the detachment. When Constable Minville returned to the interview room, Curtis continued to sing in his presence, and quote. Before Curtis left the interview room that day, he said, quote, You know, all it takes is just a little tip, a little lead, you know, recovering this poor little girl, you know, end quote. After some more investigation police became aware of three text messages between Hillary Bunnell and her cousin Haley on the morning of her disappearance. Haley did not respond, probably due to the time. These were Hillary's final communications. At 7.25 a.m., Hillary wrote, OMG, Haley, I want to leave. Something must have frightened her to cause her to leave the party that she'd been attending. 
Later on, she wrote, Please answer me. I'm scared. And this was at 7.52 a.m., three minutes after her departure from 4D's convenience store. Almost a half hour later, Hillary wrote, OMF, text me. I'm scared. This was Hillary's last text message, sent around 8.20 a.m. Hillary Bunnell had disappeared without a trace. It seemed as though no one knew where she was. Her family and the rest of the community of Eskinobotich kept looking for her. Police were becoming increasingly concerned for Hillary's safety, that the worst might have happened to her. And we'll take a break right here. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat. Available now. And we're back. Matthew, thoughts? Oh my God, she's 16. 16 years old. Those texts are freaking me out. Yeah. I don't know if you're going to tell us what was going on. I kind of don't want to know, but they're chilling. Mm -hmm. And I'm feeling really bad for her. Like, what was freaking her out? What was happening? Exactly. We'll never know because she's not around to tell us. So, yeah, it was, uh, was terrible. By October 2009, police had spoken to Curtis Bonnell again on several occasions. What Bonnell was saying was not adding up, and his casual behavior disturbed them. As well, there were others in the community who told them they thought Curtis might have something to do with what happened to Hillary. By October 5, 2009, Corporal Greg Lupson, the RCMP officer in charge of the investigation into Hillary Bonnell's disappearance, raised Curtis Bonnell's status in the inquiry from person of interest to suspect. Police now believe that Curtis Bunnell had picked up Hillary Bunnell as she was walking down the road near Eskinobotich First Nation on September 5, 2009. They also believed he had sexually assaulted and killed her. The RCMP set plans in motion to tap Curtis's phone and bug his home to gather evidence. But when it became clear that Curtis needed attention for another matter, that plan was put on hold. A second, anonymous girl from Eskinobotich made a sexual assault complaint against Curtis Bunnell. According to court documents, on November 3, 2009, armed with a search warrant, Constable DeVoe and Constable Minville, along with a number of RCMP officers, went to Curtis Bunnell's home. Constable DeVoe showed Curtis the warrant and asked him if he wanted the officer to go through the particulars of the warrant with him. Curtis Bunnell scowled and said, No, I know the law. As the cops searched, Curtis became increasingly agitated, especially with the number of RCMP vehicles in front of his home. Curtis didn't like how it made him look, hinting that if they did not clear out soon, he would let his dogs out of the place where he'd locked them while the search was going on, and they were not friendly. Although pissed off, he didn't seem intimidated by the presence of the police in his home. On Sunday evening at 11.25 p.m., November 8, 2009, Officers DeVoe, Minville, and Amiot, accompanied by other RCMP officers, arrived at Curtis Bunnell's home. This time, they had a warrant to arrest him. The arrest warrant alleged that he had recently sexually assaulted the teenage girl from Eskinobotich and had forcibly confined her. Curtis answered the door with a knife in his hands when the police knocked. For the next 20 minutes, there was a standoff as officers repeatedly screamed for him to drop the knife. Curtis refused and screamed, shoot me, shoot me. One of the officers pulled his taser gun and hit Curtis dead center. Curtis seemed relatively unaffected by the electricity pumping into his body and was angered. He simply cut the wires from his body with the knife in his hand. However, Curtis soon ran out of steam and just eventually gave up and was taken into custody. To ensure all their T's were crossed and I's dotted, Officer Amiot read an arrest script to Curtis Bonnell as follows from court documents. RCMP District 8, Trackadine, New Brunswick. Arrest information for Curtis Bonnell. 2. Curtis Bonnell, also known as Wayne Curtis Dedham. 
from RCMP District 8, Trackety. This notice is to ensure that you clearly understand you have been arrested today for 1. The sexual assault of MWS 2. The forcible confinement of MWS In addition to that matter, you are also the subject of a police investigation into the following offenses. 3. The kidnapping of Hilary Bonnell. 4. The murder of Hilary Bonnell. 5. Committing an indignity to a human body. Dated this 8th day of November 2009 at or near Neguac, New Brunswick. Curtis was taken back to the Neguac detachment of the RCMP in order to interview him and allow him to get in touch with legal counsel. Constable Minville repeated the request that Curtis should call a lawyer three times. Curtis became upset with him and told him it was his right not to call a lawyer. Curtis was bunked in a cell with an undercover RCMP officer in the hopes he would say something overnight, but he was pretty quiet. On the morning of November 9, 2009, Curtis Bonnell refused to eat any breakfast and the interviews with him began. He was still refusing a lawyer. Curtis and Constable Minville discussed the alleged sexual assault of the teenager. Curtis Bonnell, 29, said it was consensual sex, that the 16-year-old had seduced him, and he could not understand why she'd be filing any complaints against him. When Corporal Lupson arrived, Curtis was reminded of his rights and the details of his arrest warrant that had been read to him the night before. He was informed of the possible penalties if he were convicted of what he was being arrested for. Curtis indicated he understood. Lupson also told Curtis that he should acquire counsel on multiple occasions, but again he refused. Lupson laid out what police believed had happened to Hillary. Curtis yawned a few times and complained he was tired. From court documents. When Lupson offered to get him a coffee early on in the interview, Curtis replied that if Lupson was paying, he wanted a Tim Hortons coffee. When asked what he wanted in the coffee, even though he did not speak much French, he replied in an animated fashion. When Lupson offered to get him a coffee early on in the interview, Curtis replied that if Lupson was paying, he wanted a Tim Hortons coffee. When asked what he wanted in the coffee, even though he did not speak much French, he replied in animated fashion, Grand Dieu Dieu, or large double double. When the coffee arrived, he again switched to French and smiled at Lupson and said in a friendly joking manner, Thank you, sir. Merci beaucoup. Tu parles français, oui? Throughout the interview, Corporal Lupson kept telling Curtis he wanted help bringing Hilary Bunnell's body home to her family and the community for a decent burial. After a few more hours of back and forth, finally, Curtis Bunnell agreed. He would take Lupson to where Hilary Bunnell's body was, but he refused to talk about what had happened with the girl. Lupson asked, Can we go in the chopper? Now? Can we go find Hilary? Bunnell replied, Let's do the right thing. Send you home, too. Hugging Curtis, Lupson said, Thank you. Bunnell said, That's what I need. A hug. Honestly. Oh. Lupson said, Let's do it together, okay? I'm going to get my jacket. Curtis said Hillary was in the woods in Tabustanac, about a half hour's drive away. They tried with the chopper first, but Bunnell couldn't identify the area in which he'd left Hillary from the air. They returned to Trackety, deciding they'd go to the area by SUV instead. Before leaving to try and find the burial site, Curtis gave the officers instructions to bring a rope with them because he believed they would get stuck on the muddy woods road they would have to use to get to the site. Police were rolling video and audio throughout the entire trip to capture every interaction with Curtis Bonnell. Curtis moaned that he was cold. He expressed his concern about people finding out what he'd done. From court documents, Bonnell said, it's good to be all over the news, me and, well, fuck. Lupson replied, You're taking control of it. You can take control of it yourself, or you can leave that cloud to history hanging up there. Bunnell said, Because actually, I'm not charged with nothing yet. Lupson said, That's right. Bunnell said, Right? To which Lupson reiterated, That's right. When they found the general area, where Bunnell said he had buried Hillary in a shallow grave with a shovel that he'd had in his truck, he said, Jackpot. Take her home. Bring some closure. Lupson said, okay. Bunnell continued, and to give my family some closure. Lupson then asked, did she suffer at all? No? Okay? Like that? The officer snapped his fingers. Bunnell didn't quite understand. 
Lepson repeated himself. Was it like that? He again snapped his fingers. Bunnell replied, Pretty close. The officers entered the woods and started looking for Hillary's body. Despite the officers clearly telling Curtis several times that he has the right to a lawyer, Curtis continued talking. I don't care what I'm charged with, I just want to go to a cell and be left alone, he said. RCMP investigators found Hillary's body right where Curtis had indicated. Then they began the meticulous task of gathering evidence they believed had relevance to the case. Next, they carefully extracted the teen from the clay of the cold ground that had preserved her relatively well. During the return trip to Trachety, Curtis cried in the back of the RCMP SUV. Curtis' father, Christopher Bunnell, came into the detachment to see his son. In Curtis' cell, the two had a conversation with Corporal Lupson present. It was, of course, recorded by the RCMP. During their discussion, Curtis Bunnell explained to his father the reason that he took police to the burial site, saying it was because he wanted to take responsibility, but did not say for what specifically. He added that he believed police would never have found Hillary Bunnell's burial site but for his decision to show it to them. Curtis said, quote, I truly believe these guys wouldn't have found her. You know that? But I did this because I care about Boyd, Hillary's father. I care about you. And that was like your daughter too. This, this is going to be a heavy burden on me for a long time, end quote. Fuck off. Right. So well, what, what, what's, what's the term here? Is this narcissism? This is narcissism, yeah. He's trying to make himself out to be like the hero slash the victim. Let's ignore the fact that he killed her, but he's like, oh, I'm doing the right thing now. Fuck off. Yeah, right? Yeah, just because you're doing, quote unquote, the right thing That's, at this point. I've, I just know a few people like this. Yeah, well, I know quite a few. Honestly, yeah. it's just, I, you, you type of people, just go away, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I actually had someone come at us for our maltreatment of narcissists in an email one time. It was probably a narcissist. Oh, it for sure was. <laughs> Curtis Bunnell was formally charged in court the next day for the sexual assault of the teenage girl. He was still refusing a lawyer. Bunnell said, quote, No, I don't want to talk to a lawyer. I don't need one. End quote. Days later, in yet another interview... Curtis said that he felt cold and thought that a spirit was coming for him. I need to go to an asylum, Curtis Bunnell said. I have things inside me like Jekyll and Hyde. He believed that the only person who could help him was a spiritual man, so police facilitated a meeting between Curtis and a local elder. According to CBC News, quote, Crews spent days using trowels in their hands to dig up the body. Hillary's body was left encased in a clay cocoon placed in a special box, and then transported to the St. John Regional Hospital for an autopsy. During the November 14th autopsy, officials tried several methods to remove the clay in order to preserve the girl's skin. They considered freezing the body. They also contemplated using x-rays and even transported her body to Border Patrol services. But they finally decided to use their hands to remove the clay and videotape the process due to its unusual nature. Dr. Ken Obenson, who performed the autopsy on the 16-year-old's body over two days, determined that, although he was not 100% sure, the probable cause of death was asphyxia. On December 2, 2009, Curtis agreed to go with RCMP officers to the place where he had buried Hillary. There, the dam finally broke and he admitted he'd killed her. What he said could be taken with a grain of salt, but here's the transcript of his confession. Quote, I dropped Dean off. I was going home. She flagged me down. She got in the truck. She asked what I was doing, so I turned around and I said I was going home. So she said, let's go. So she came and we turned around and she wanted to do, a uh, do something. I don't know what it was. And then I told her, let's have sex. She said, okay. And then after that, she wanted, she, she wanted money. But I said, no, because school was starting. She wanted money. And I said, no. So she turned around and she started freaking out. And then we got in, we got into it. There was a, and then after that, uh, I, I hit her and she was screaming and I just held her mouth so she'd stop screaming. And when I realized what I was doing, it was already too late. 
I held her mouth, and then I panicked. I freaked out. I sat there crying. I checked her pulse, and then I just turned around, and I, I, I was crying for a while. I kept, I continued drinking, and, and then after that, I, uh, uh, I chucked everything on my truck, garbage, aluminum tin, I don't know, and plastic, and, and plastic siding. I, I chucked that over her, and then came here, and this is where I buried her. End quote. Bunnell said that he remembered dragging Hillary's body to the place where he would bury it and was saying the Lord's Prayer over her body for his soul. Quote, I saw that lifeless poor girl in front of me. What the fuck did I do? End quote. He said when he returned home he wanted to kill himself but didn't for Hillary's sake. He described more details. I remember the grass, he said. I was crying on that part where she lost her last breath. End quote. Curtis was finally charged with first-degree murder of his 16-year-old cousin, Hillary Bonnell. He was now saying that he was not guilty, of course. He claimed that he woke up on the morning of September 5, 2009, after a night of alcohol and drugs, to find Hillary dead next to him in his pickup truck. He was now saying he didn't know how she died but panicked and then buried her in the woods. He'd initially given the statement that he did because he was tired. According to a CBC News article, quote, February 6, 2012 was the date set for the sexual assault trial for Curtis Wayne Bonnell. On November 8, 2009, he was charged after the assault of a 16-year-old girl. Bonnell, 30, was charged with sexual assault, illegal confinement, resisting arrest, and attempting to engage in anal intercourse with a girl whose name can't be disclosed under a publication ban. The victim, like Curtis Bonnell, is also a resident of the Eskinobitich First Nation Reserve, also known as Burnt Church. Bunnell's first-degree murder trial in the murder of his then 16-year-old cousin Hillary Bunnell is slated for August 16, 2012. If convicted, he faces a minimum 25 years in prison. Curtis's murder trial began in September 2012 after a number of hearings to determine the admissibility of evidence. The evidence of the Crown relied heavily on testimony of Hillary's family, friends, of experts, the RCMP, and the videotaped statements of Curtis Bunnell the same ones that the defense attorneys he'd finally acquired were now refuting. From a Global News report, quote, The court was told that the autopsy and toxicology reports were inconclusive on the exact cause of death, but termed the manner of death as homicide. But a forensic pathologist called by the defense disagreed with the homicide determination, saying Hillary could have died as a result of, quote, positional asphyxia which can happen when someone is intoxicated and they fall into a slumped position that constricts their airway. Curtis Bunnell even testified in his own defense. When asked how he felt about the interrogations, he said, quote, I was just tired and sick and not feeling well, end quote. He said the police would not let him sleep. He was sticking to his story that Hillary had just died in this truck while he was sleeping off his intoxication from the night before. Curtis's lawyer, Mr. Lemieux, asked, in your mind, why did you want them to find the body? Curtis said, well, it was an opportunity to face the music and maybe find out what happened to Hillary to explain it. When I tried to open up to him, he just shut me down. There were times I tried to explain, like saying, what if I know where she is and had nothing to do with anything else? But he said, that's not the truth. I was scared that if the animals get at her, we would never find out what happened to her. That's why I did what I did put her there. Lemieux then asked, but then you led the police to her grave. Why? Curtis replied, that's where I thought everything would end. I couldn't explain how she died. I didn't know what to do. It was an opportunity to bring her home and find out what happened to her. End quote. According to the Canadian press, quote, after six weeks of testimony, Judge Fred Ferguson of the Court of Queen's Bench told the six-man, six-woman jury in Miramichi that they have the option of finding Bunnell guilty of first-degree murder, second-degree murder, manslaughter, or not guilty of any crime. The jury deliberated for about six and a half hours late Friday and early Saturday morning before coming back with a verdict. They'd found Curtis Wayne Bunnell guilty as charged. When the decision was read, Hillary's family cheered and wept openly in the courtroom. After the guilty verdict, outside the courtroom, Miramichi Online recorded video and audio of Pamela Fillier and other members of Hillary Bunnell's family reacting to the guilty verdict in Curtis Bunnell's murder trial. A cigarette in hand to calm her, through tears, Pamela cried out, 
Hillary was never hit a day in her life. This was her first time getting hurt, and it friggin' killed her. End quote. At Curtis Bunnell's sentencing, the convicted killer listened to the victim impact statements of Pam Fillier, Hillary's mother, Fred Fillier, Hillary's stepfather, and Boyd Bonnell, Hillary's father. The details of the following statements were reported on the news website Miramichi Online. Fred Fillier said in part, quote, Curtis Bonnell, you have done a lot of damage to my family. Not only do we have to grieve for what you did, we also have to fight daily to survive. You gave us all a life sentence. Boyd Bunnell, Hillary's dad, was up next. He said, quote, When the police told me they found her, I asked if she was okay. They said it wasn't good news. It still hurts me knowing I will not see her graduate and will not be able to walk her down the aisle. All the things a father should do with his daughter. I just don't understand how Curtis could do this but he will have a lot of time to think about what he's done and how it has affected us for the rest of our lives. Pam Fillier, Hillary's mom, was the last to speak. Pam said, From the day Hillary went missing, life became a nightmare. The stress was so unbearable, my hair was falling out, I couldn't eat or sleep. The stress has caused me to become a severe diabetic, and I was in remission from rheumatoid arthritis, but now it is back. I have nightmares all the time. To describe how I'm feeling is so difficult. I never get to hear her laugh or sing again. She made our house a home, and I feel like an empty shell without her. This person robbed me of my baby girl. I never get to buy her a prom dress or get to see her graduate. She will never be a bride or a mommy. Throughout the trial, it became clear he had no remorse. One day, you will answer to the highest court of all for the evil you have done, Pam said to Curtis. The worst was when you drug her name through the mud, and I hope you get what you gave. Justice Fred Ferguson asked Curtis if he had anything to say. Curtis said he had nothing to say. Curtis was sentenced to life, and he must remain behind bars for a minimum of 25 years before he can apply for parole. All his appeals have failed. In mid-February 2018, As part of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, a community hearing was held over two days in Moncton. On the first day, Pam and Fred Fillier, Hillary Bunnell's mom and stepdad, testified before the inquiry. A news article was filed that day by Global News reporter Shelley Steves. She captured audio of Pamela Fillier speaking about her feelings on her daughter's death, the inquiry, and the perpetrator, Curtis Bunnell. Here's a bit of what she had to say. She was 16 years old when she was murdered. It was an emotional day for New Brunswick mother Pam Fillier, whose teenage daughter Hillary Bennell was murdered in 2009. It's still really hard. They say time heals wounds, not when you lose, not when you lose your child. Fillier was the first to testify at the Moncton hearings. She's calling for stiffer laws for those who commit violent acts. Bunnell's cousin was convicted of her murder in 2012, sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. Not good enough for this mom. Why isn't he on the list to not be let out again? He, he, shouldn't, be, he shouldn't be let out. The goal of the inquiry is to examine and report on the systematic causes of violence against Indigenous women and girls in Canada. Roughly 40 family members like Fillier and victims of violence will speak over the next two days. Organizers say they are in the process of applying to extend the inquiry by up to another two years, allowing more time for people like Fillier to tell their stories. My goal is not just to protect my people. It's for all the little girls out there because I don't have, that was my only daughter. Shelley Steves, Global News, Moncton. So there you hear right directly no, I from. I so hard, bad for her. Do these, all, do these commissions get anything done? Because it's the action that would be put into place. That's mm-hmm. the only thing that can help. Yeah, I mean, the this co- particular commission, a lot of it is about awareness. Right. And that is happening. Um, it informed me in this podcast. Okay. I guess sort of the information and the knowledge is the first step, right? Mm-hmm. And these sorts of things, hearing from actual people. Mm-hmm. We have to gather the information. We have to hear their stories before we can take any action yeah. to 
make things better yeah. to improve the situations that they're in. It's just horrible as well. Can you imagine? Like, it was her own relative as well. Mm-hmm. Her first cousin, yeah. I mean, I wonder if that tore the family apart. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And what I read, Pam Fillier was rightfully so quite angry with parts of that family. So, you know, I mean, it's horrendous, these things happening to... Well, she was a little girl. She's only 16. Whenever I hear these stories, I wish I had sort of a magic wand to bring their daughter back, you know? Yeah. It's horrible. You can learn more about the National Inquiry into the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls in this week's show notes. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode 193, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. What happened to Hilary Bonnell? That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or one 877 dark We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. Hi, this is, uh, this is Stephanie Thibodeau calling from London, Ontario. I would just like to say that your podcast is awesome. I listen to it all the time. I guess I'm not, I'm not very good at um, doing voicemails, as you could tell, but... I just love you guys. Um, guess I'm supposed to say, go take a shit in your hat. So there you go. Keep on doing what you're doing and bye. Thanks for giving us a call, Stephanie. Much appreciated. And Thanks, uh, Stephanie. Upon listening, you'll probably notice that it sounds more together than it was. So I edited a bit of your, a few of your pauses out just because I thought yeah. your voicemail was great anyway. Yeah. So thank you so much. She was from London, Ontario. Shout out to London, my so, peeps. A lot of uh, people from Matthew's old stomping grounds. The stomping ground. Yeah, yeah. You have some other episodes about or that area that we're going to... I'm writing them now. Uh, yeah, exciting. I'm looking forward to having some more episodes that I didn't have to... I'm going to be the Southwestern Ontario murder specialist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. Then everyone will complain, what about Alberta? <laughs> what about Alberta? What about New Brunswick? What about many? Yeah, we hear you. We hear you. Hey, if you want to write an episode. Yeah, no. No. No, I'm not going to say that. Next up, we have from Victoria, British Columbia, David. So let's listen to what David had to say. This is David from Victoria, BC. Uh, I just wanted to talk about go shit in your hat as it's such a lovely Canadian way of telling someone where to go and how to get there. But what I really was thinking about lately is other ways to say it. And of course, there's a go poop in your toque or go take a crap in your hat. But I'm a festive guy myself and you know I quite like Halloween. So I found a fun way to say it for the month of October, if you will. And it's go take a spooky dookie in your tookie. And I thought you guys might enjoy that. So, shit in your hat. I love the podcast. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs> well, there you go. I love it. Thanks, David. A spooky dookie in your tookie. I took a spooky dookie in my tookie this morning. I was, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I think it's going to come back and haunt me at some point. <laughs> yeah, when you put your hat on. Oh, dear. No, that's not nice. But anyway. <laughs> Hilarious. Uh, our last voicemail comes to us from Pickering, Ontario, another Ontarian. Pickering. Pickering. I was on the phone with Pickering last week. There you go. Mm. Not all of them. Hey, guys. My name is Megan, and I'm from Pickering, Ontario. I've been listening to uh, Dark Routine for a long time, um, and I'm so grateful and happy for this last episode that I listened to about Vince Lee. Um, a few other podcasts that I know have covered it, and I've listened intently. Um and you guys were kind of the first to really touch on the fact that schizophrenia is a mental illness. And there's a reason in Canada that we don't just throw people into the, I was going to say into the bus, but that would not be funny, but into the, into the fire and, and just let them burn, you know? Um, thank you guys so much for this episode. It was so wonderful to hear your take on it. 
Um, and you, you gave a great homage to Tim McLean. He deserves it, obviously, and his family as well. But Vince Lee um, also needed a little bit of a background story to understand that he wasn't just some dude on a bus who just went crazy. So thank you guys so much. Uh, love your podcast. Bye. Well, thank you. Thank I, you. I, and I've gotten a lot of feedback like that about the uh, Greyhound Bus 1170 episode. Mm. So, yeah, I really appreciate that. And we... We were nervous about doing that episode for a lot of people were asking for it. Mm -hmm. But it was um, yeah. pretty heavy. So we kind of put it, it off for a while. <laughs> well, I had a percolating in my brain. Yeah. And that's what I do with the big episodes, the really one, the ones the that difficult people, ones, yeah. yeah, the difficult ones, the ones that people are really aware of, you may, there are some glaring deficits as far as popular, should I say popular, uh, true crime episodes in Canada that I have not done. And this was one of them. And the reason being is I wanted to do it in such a way that it wouldn't be just like any other podcast, um, uh, just telling a, a story about yeah. a person on a bus being murdered. Yeah. Uh, it was, I wanted to ensure that we approached it in the right way. So I had to let it, yeah. let it percolate a little bit and, and it made a better cup of coffee, frankly. Yeah. 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 And you know, in most recent ones as well, it's, you don't really want to necessarily do them, do you? Because no. it's, it's all just happening and it's fresh and the families are still going through it. Yeah. Know? And so we do get a lot of requests to do episodes about crimes that have just happened. But Maybe the person was just convicted. It feels a little somehow distasteful. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Like, and in a way, um, giving it, giving it a little time is probably a better thing for everybody. Yeah. yeah. You know, so... I don't know. I just, I'm glad that, uh, I've chosen to wait to do a bunch of these. Yeah. Yeah. And there's more coming. Planning a big, big, uh, really, uh, I'm planning to do a one that people will recognize as soon as they see this perpetrator's name coming mm -hmm. up here soon. So should be another interesting episode or two. Two. Maybe a two-parter. Two-parter. Anyway. Double parter for DP. Yeah, exactly. That's it for voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 327 ptn PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Try and keep it under two minutes if you can. We love you folks. Thank you. Bye. There's no patrons or donut money donors this week. Shh, so no, Mike, don't say that. What? There aren't. Oh. So Mike will be living uh, hand to mouth, hand to mouth, <laughs> for the next little while. <laughs> I'll be okay. Um, I don't have any don't have any savings. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's horrendous. Yeah, things are bad. <laughs> anyway, maybe someone will give us some love. Who knows? Who knows? It could happen. Or not. Or not. And uh, yeah, so mm, I guess this is being released on November 1st. So tomorrow you can get my book in stores wow. if you want. It's no longer a pre-order. It's an order and you get it. So Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, just if you don't see it on the shelves of your local bookstore... Ask them to order it in for you Absolutely. and maybe tell them about it. Uh, mm. My mom told the Coles bookstore in my, in the mall Aww. in Bridgewater that I have a book coming out and would they like to stock it? Well, that's actually a good idea because if you're local, mm -hmm. right, you're from there. Yeah. Books sell more from local artists in, in the, in the area. So that's actually smart. They should pick it up. And as I am going home for Christmas for the first time in 20 years, well, oh, good Lord, but that's not my choice. It's just my mom was always, don't come home. That was your first time home in 28 years. 28 years, yeah. Ever? Ever. Uh, no, no. Just for, for Christmas. Christmas. Okay. For Christmas. No, I've been home. Jesus, I was thinking you're a bad son. No, just not at Christmas you're time. You're sort of bad son, but go on. <laughs> anyway, so just at Christmas, but I'm going home. Glad and I'm, you're not my kid. We're going to do a meetup in Halifax. Details coming soon, and it will be with Jordan from the Nighttime Podcast and myself. At the library there I, in Halifax. I won't be there. You won't be there? 
And then I will probably do something else in Bridgewater, most likely at the pub. And maybe even a bit of book signing at the mall, depending on whether or not they'll have me. Then after that, I will be in Berwick. Are you going to sign a book in a lighthouse? Sign a book in a lighthouse? Yeah. What difference would it make? I know, because I'm just picturing your sort of East Coast lifestyle. Have you seen the movie The Lighthouse with Robert Pattinson? Is that the one when the fog rolls in and there's monsters in the fog? No, that's a different movie. Okay. But yeah, this this one is essentially, uh, yeah, you need to watch it. The okay. Lighthouse, Robert Pattinson. It's on Amazon Prime. I'll watch it. Okay, please do. And then tell me how uh, how well you slept the next okay. night. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Yeah, it's Willem Dafoe as well. So oh, I like It's quite him. good. Anyway, uh, that is it for this week's episode. Thank you to all our patrons and donut money donors, past and present, uh, even the ones who didn't donate this week. We, <laughs> we appreciate your non-donation. Yeah, exactly. Th uh, <laughs> your generosity helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it'd mean a lot to us if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And don't forget, please, please buy my book. <laughs> I need to eat. Uh, and that's it. Until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Goodbye. Bye. I said to my parents, don't trust her. I wouldn't listen. Every family has a secret. Joy Delaney, mother of four, has gone missing. From the author of Big Little Lies comes a chilling new mystery to W. You were an emotional chaos sinkhole, Amy, and I'm sick of it! Starring Annette Bening. Nobody can break your heart like your own children. And Sam Neill. She will come back. Here we go. Strap in. Apples never fall. All new Thursdays, only on W. Stream on Stack TV.